Unit 12, Infection. So spell and define terms located at the beginning of this chapter. Identify the most common microbes and describe some of their characteristics. Uh, identify the links in the chain of infection and ways infectious diseases are spread. Define spores and explain how they differ from other pathogens. And then list natural body defenses against infections and explain why patients are at risk for infections, which we'll talk about. So humans are surrounded by a world of tiny organisms. They're on us, they're in us, they're around us, uh, and they really only make their presence known by their effects. And they're, they cannot be seen with the naked eye, they can only be seen through a microscope. So there are different types of uh, microbes. Pathogen, that means it's disease-causing microbe. Uh, normal flora, microbes that are necessary for body function. So they're actually useful for our body in um, helping with it functioning properly. And then non-pathogenic, so microbes that do not cause disease or infection. So bacteria are simple one-celled microbes. So we've all heard of bacteria. They're named according to their shapes and arrangement, which is important. Uh, and they cause infections in the skin, the respiratory tract, urinary tract, and bloodstream, so sepsis. So fungi, two groups most commonly associated with infection in humans are yeasts and molds, and those are just the most commonly associated infections. For Sorry. So viruses are the smallest microbe. They have a variety of shapes, and what's really, really important to uh, remember about viruses is that they mutate very, very rapidly. So we had a great example of this is influenza, so the, the flu, and so that is why people have to get a flu vaccine every year, because the, the virus mutates so rapidly that in order to keep up with, you know, providing immunity and providing um, a current vaccination, they have to provide a new one every year because the, the virus mutates so rapidly. Protozoa, so they're simple one-celled organisms, and these live on living matter. So the chain of infection, so this is really, really important because in order to, to uh, have infection, you have to have all these different links in the chain here. So a causative agent, reservoir source, portal of exit, method of transmission, portal of entry, and susceptible host, and so we'll talk about these. So you only need to break one link in the chain to prevent the spread of disease. So this is in page 143 in your text, and this is really, really important for us to remember as healthcare workers because you break any link in this chain and you're going to prevent the spread of disease, which is really, really important. So make sure you go through and review this, and you'll see at the top there is hand washing. So making sure that you do good hand washing and try to break any of these links in the, in the chain to prevent spread of disease. So the causative agent is the microorganism that can cause disease in humans. Uh, the reservoir source, so this is where the pathogens, remember, um, disease-causing bacteria live, multiply, and survive. So they may or may not multiply, um, it doesn't matter, but they live, multi potentially multiply, and survive is considered the reservoir source. So examples in humans or animals or on environmental surfaces. So the susceptible host is a person who can become infected with the pathogen, is unable to resist the microorganism, invading the body, multiplying, and causing infection. And really, when you think about this, this is pretty much all of our patients, so or residents. Anybody that's um, going to be susceptible, they're in a healthcare facility for whatever reason. They have a decreased immune system, and so they're going to be a truly a susceptible host. Um, so the host is susceptible to disease, so they lack the immune or physical resistance to overcome the invasion of pathogens. So they may be sick with something else, and so that's dampened their immune system. There's many things that can cause susceptibility. So portals of entry. So locations where organisms that can enter the body are called portals. So this can be body openings, uh, mucous membranes, so our eyes, our nose, or breaks in the skin. And we often cause breaks in the skin. We, we place IVs, um, we, you know, anything that we cause a disruption of skin. The skin is one of our most important defenses against bacteria. And so when we create an entry, we create a hole in the skin. We're allowing potential bacteria to be um, entering the body. Sorry.
Okay, so this that can also result from tubes placed in the body or punctures produced by invasive procedures. So urinary catheters. So a catheter is a great source of infection. So you, we always have to be very mindful that they um, to keep them clean and to use them as a last resort. And then intravenous fluid. So again, we start an IV in a patient. We're now creating a portal of entry. So portals of exit, um, you'll probably appreciate this picture here on the right. So infectious organisms leave the reservoir or human host through body secretions. These are or portals of exit. So portal provides a way for a pathogen to leave the reservoir. So a great example, as you see on the right, is a nose or a mouth during a sneeze or cough. So just looking at these particles, how far they go, and this is a great way for the pathogen to leave the reservoir and you know potentially pass on to a susceptible host. So body flora. So different microbes live on our body surfaces. Uh, microbes are called normal body flora. So uh, flora are not the same in all body areas. And this is really important to remember. So um, flora are important in the areas in which they normally reside. But let's say the flora from your intestinal tract gets placed somewhere outside of the, the intestinal tract. It can then be pathogenic. So normal flora, they have to reside in the part of the body where they should be. Essentially. So they're not harmful where they normally reside, but once they may cause infection if they're moved to another area of the body. So we talk about certain disease, diseases, so hepatitis A, for example, as a fecal oral, um, something that gets transferred from one part of the body to the other part, although hepatitis A is not the greatest example because that's not normal flora, but something that goes from, you know, fecal oral would be potentially another type of bacteria that's that's common in the intestinal tract, but then when it gets um, transferred to the gastrointestinal, you know, the stomach, it's not where it should be and can cause infection. So body defenses. The body has some natural defenses to protect itself from infections. The most important one of which is our skin. So um, the skin protects us and that's why it's so, so important that we keep intact skin because once the skin, there's a portal of it, once there's a break in the skin, there's now a portal of entry for microbes. So immunizations, these are artificial defenses that protect against specific pathogens, so provided by vaccines. So a lot of the vaccinations that you had to get for this class, hepatitis B, for example, is going to protect you against specific pathogens. Immunosuppression. So this occurs when the body's immune system is inadequate. So this is um, the case for many of our patients and residents. So it fails to respond to challenge of infectious disease organisms that it would normally be able to fight off successfully. So depending on what's going on with the person, if they're already fighting off another disease process, if they're immunocompromised from something such as AIDS, they're going to be more susceptible and so less have less of an ability to fight off uh, an infectious disease. So bacterial infections, they often cause serious skin, respiratory, urinary, and gastrointestinal infections. So if the physician suspects the patient has a bacterial infection, they'll do a culture and sensitivity, which is essentially testing what is the bacteria that's causing the disease and what type of antibiotic is it sensitive to, what would be most um, effective in treating this type of infection. So resistance, so there are two groups of organisms that have become resistant to two powerful antibiotics. And this is really, really important because what's happening here is that there's bacteria that have, um, for different reasons, become resistant to really powerful antibiotics. So two examples of this are methicillin and vancomycin. So you've probably heard maybe on the news about MRSA, but this is really methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So it's a Staph aureus uh, bacteria that's now resistant to methicillin, which used to do a very good job of um, treating these types of infections, and now it's a new type of um, infection that can't really be treated by the normal uh, method. And then also vanc vancomycin-resistant enterococci, so VRE, which is also really a, a harsh antibiotic that used to work very well against this and now is no longer effective. So viral infections, so shingles, influenza, hepatitis, um, AIDS, these are all types of viral infections. 
So spores, this is really important to remember as well. So they're microscopic reproductive bodies and they're responsible for the spread of some diseases. The important thing to really remember is that spores can they live dormant until conditions are ideal for reproduction. So they can live dormant for a long, long time until conditions are great and then they'll come back um, and cause disease or causes disease in humans. So they can multiply and continue to spread infection and they're very, very difficult to eliminate. So um, alcohol hand sanitizer does not kill spores. Spores have to be mechanically removed by hand washing and so it's very, very important that you're doing good hand washing. So alcohol will not kill the spores. Again, the mechanical action will um, loosen the spores and then washing them down the drain. So that's what's going to help get rid of them. So making sure that again we use our alcohol, we use our hand sanitizer, but especially if somebody is diagnosed with a spore related illness, you're making sure you're doing very good hand washing. So as parasites, they survive by feeding off another human or animal. So there's some great photos in your book on this. Uh, so examples, head lice, they can be spread from direct contact. So you know, from hair follicle to hair follicle or indirect contact, so maybe sharing a hat or something like that. Um, scabies is a skin disease caused by a mite, a mite, excuse me, um, a microscopic organism that cannot be seen with the naked eye. So there's pictures of both of these in your uh, text. So bed bugs, so a lot of people <laughs> would think bed bugs were not real things. They're real parasites. Um, so they survive in hot and cold environments. They're actually a very, very resil resilient parasite. They can live up to a year without eating and so that's why they're very very difficult to get rid of. Um, the bites cause a painful rash on the skin and they feed at night because uh, they have people that keep coming back to bed every night and so they're able to keep feeding. Um, the bed bugs luckily do not tra transmit disease but they do cause um, bites and a painful rash on the skin. So bioterrorism, so this is the use of biological agents for terrorist purposes. So they're pathogenic organisms, so disease-causing organisms, um, agricultural pests. The important thing to remember is that if there's ever anything suspected of being a bioterrorist act, so anthrax, for example, so anthrax is so rare that if there is an anthrax attack, it's always considered, or you're always investigating to make sure it's not a bioterrorist act. So you just make sure you follow the policies and procedures of your health care facility. So an outbreak of infectious disease in a healthcare facility, so this is really, really important because again, people come to a healthcare facility for treatment. We don't want to be exposing them to any other types of infectious diseases. So it can be serious for patients unless steps are taken immediately. So as soon as you may notice that you start to see um, an infectious disease, especially if you're seeing it, um, symptoms in multiple patients, making sure that you're reporting that information to the nurse because once an infection starts, it can spread very, very rapidly.